Good evening, I'm Justin Ford, pastor of Oakdale Baptist Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. And I want to welcome you to something that has never been done before at OBC, an online celebration of Good Friday and the Lord's Supper. Now, obviously, under normal circumstances, we would be celebrating tonight and celebrating Good Friday and the Lord's Supper together in our worship center, but not much is normal right now, is it? Due to the restrictions that are in place to help us control the spread of the coronavirus, we can't all be here together. But due to the technology that is thankfully available to us, we can be together apart. And so tonight, our worship pastor, Jamie Smith, and I will be leading you and leading your family in a time of worship and reflection and repentance and celebration. And although we know it won't be the same as what we typically experience, hopefully it will still be very special and it will certainly be historic. Now, if you haven't done so already, you need to gather up the items that you will use tonight for the Lord's Supper. We call what we call elements, and normally we would provide you with cups filled with grape juice and some form of bread, and you may have those things already and ready to go. We posted a recipe on Facebook for unleavened bread that you could bake at home, and so maybe you have that ready to go. This is the bread that my daughter and I baked, gluten-free uh, unleavened bread. But if you don't have these specific items that we're talking about, we want you to feel free to utilize whatever you do have on hand. Most everyone probably has at least a little bit of bread in their home, so please use that. If you don't have juice or wine for the cup, you're welcome to use something else that you can drink. If that seems a little bit unusual to you, consider this. If Jesus had lived in 21st century Oklahoma, it could have easily been sweet tea that he picked up and passed out to his disciples during their last meal together. Now, obviously, there's something very symbolic about the wine that Jesus used, and especially the color, which was meant to remind us of his blood. But I want you to feel free to utilize whatever you have uh, available to you tonight. So if you have your elements ready, let me ask you to just settle in, whether you're watching this from your living room or from a hotel room far from home or maybe even from a hospital bed. Whether you're watching by yourself or with your family, settle in and know that you are not alone, that God's presence is absolutely with you no matter where you are, and that this can and will be a very special time tonight. Let's start with a word of prayer, and let's ask God to begin preparing our hearts for communion with Him. Heavenly Father, we just come before you tonight and we're so thankful at the opportunity to be together, even though we're apart. And God, there's hardly anything I can think of that is better than celebrating your sacrifice on the cross, celebrating your love for us and what you did for us. And so tonight, God, we celebrate this ancient ritual that you yourself performed with your closest friends. God, may this be a time tonight that helps to focus us in on what you've done, to focus in on the sacrifice of the cross, and ultimately to focus on the resurrection of Jesus. God, we look forward to this time together with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, over the past seven weeks here at OBC, we've been learning on Sunday mornings about God's will for our lives how we find it, how we can be obedient to it, and what the consequences can be if we don't. With that in mind, what I'd like to do before we begin the Lord's Supper is show you the connection between God's will in the Old Testament and God's will in the New Testament and beyond. Because I believe that that gives us a better perspective on why we do what we do when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Now, in week two of our series, I mentioned a couple of people to you who would have never probably even been mentioned in the Bible if we had been writing it. But they're there because God had a bigger and better plan for these two guys than anybody could have imagined. First, I mentioned Abraham. 
Abraham was called by God to leave the land in which he lived, to go far away to a land that he knew nothing about, eventually to have a son with his too old to get pregnant wife, and finally become the founding father of the original one nation under God, Israel. Now, when God began to reveal his plan to Abraham, he didn't show it to him all at once. He did it a little at a time as Abraham was obedient. But what he did do was to establish what's called a covenant or a promise with Abraham right up front. Here's what God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now here's what you need to know about the first covenant as it pertained to God's will. When God makes a promise, he does not break it. But God is not confined to our expectations, our understanding, or our timeline. Really, if you start right there in Genesis 12 and you work through Scripture all the way up to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, what you'll find is the story of a nation who was constantly in need of redemption and restoration because they could never quite get a handle on what God's plan was and what he was trying to accomplish. Over and over again, they lost sight of God's will and God's plan. And over and over again, God rescued them and proved his love and faithfulness to them. A perfect example of that is the story of Exodus. The other guy I mentioned to you several weeks back was Moses. I told you that Moses had grown up in the house of Pharaoh, that he had spent a season of his life on the run, and, and was eventually called by God to take a message back to Pharaoh. You probably know that part of the story. What you may not know are the circumstances that the Israelites found themselves in before Moses came. Israel had a solid relationship with Egypt for many, many, many years. But when a new Pharaoh took over, he feared that there were so many Israelites living in Egypt that they might overrun the Egyptians someday. And so Pharaoh enslaved the Israelites. And he used them to carry out his grand building plan in Egypt. Well, this didn't go on for just a year or two, not even for a hundred years or two. The bondage lasted for 400 years. And by the time 400 years had rolled around, the Israelites no longer were thinking about God's plan or God's covenant. They just sort of resigned themselves to the fact that God had completely forgotten them. But that's when God brings Moses back into the picture. He sends Moses to Pharaoh with a message, let my people go. Pharaoh says, that's not going to happen. And so God begins to send plagues on Egypt to destroy all of the things that were the most important to them. He turned the Nile River into blood. He sent frogs, gnats, and flies to destroy their crops. He sent disease on their livestock and boils on their own bodies. He sent hail, then locusts, then darkness. It covered the entire land for three straight days. And then when the Egyptians didn't think they could stand any more, God sent the worst plague imaginable. He sent an angel of death to visit each household in Egypt, taking the life of each and every firstborn son. Now, up until this point, the Israelites were merely spectators in all of this. But this last plague was different. During this last plague, the Israelites had a choice to make. Would they once again put their trust in Jehovah God? Or would they forget how faithful he had been to them over and over and over again throughout their history? Here's what they were instructed to do. Each family was to prepare a meal of unleavened bread And then they were to take a perfect, spotless lamb, slaughter it, roast it, and eat it together. At the same time, they were to take the blood of this lamb and put it on the sides and the tops of their doorposts. And then when the angel of death came through Egypt, he would pass over every house where the blood of the lamb had been displayed. 
And that night, just as God had promised, there was wailing and gnashing of teeth throughout Egypt as they mourned the deaths of their firstborn sons. But the Israelites, they were celebrating as they broke free and began their journey to the promised land. Now, one other thing from this story that is really important. As the Israelites set out from Egypt, God gave them a command that every year at the same time, they were to celebrate the fact that God had been faithful to the covenant and had delivered them from Egyptian slavery. Part of that celebration would be to tell the story of how it happened so that generation after generation would never forget. They were also to eat unleavened bread and roasted lamb as they had originally done. And from that day forward, this celebration would be known as Passover, both a celebration and a commemoration of God's grace and of his mercy. Okay, now fast forward about 1,600 years to the time of the New Testament. Once again, the Israelites are ruled by an oppressive nation, this time Rome. Once again, they're wondering if God has forgotten them. Will he remember the covenant that he had previously made? But God had not forgotten, not even close. Human history was about to change forever. This time, instead of sending a spotless animal, God sends his one and only son, the sinless, true lamb of God. For 33 years, Jesus ministers and teaches and does miraculous things, all the while trying to help the people see that his path is leading to the cross. Finally, on the night of the Passover feast, the same Passover that had been celebrated for 1,600 years since the day the Israelites had been set free from Egypt, Jesus gathers together his disciples and he sits down in a rented room to share the Passover meal together. Luke twenty-two nineteen 19 says, And he took bread and he gave thanks. Now, if you've ever wondered why unleavened bread was used, let me just quickly explain the significance. For the Israelites of the Old Testament, the yeast that you would normally use to make bread symbolized sin. And so if you eat bread that is made without yeast, you are symbolizing an act of purity. Does that make sense? And so when God told them to celebrate the Passover from now on by eating the unleavened bread... It was a way of reminding them of how he purified them and kept them free from the punishment of the angel of death. But the unleavened bread had another purpose as well. It prepared them through all of those years for the ultimate sacrifice that would be made by Jesus. And so when Jesus picks up this pure yeastless bread during the Passover feast, what does he do with it? Does he toss it in the trash and say, the old covenant is gone. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Does he feed it to the disciples but refuse to eat it himself? Because even without the yeast, it had been stained by human hands? No. Instead, he took it and he broke it. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says, And he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do you see the connection between God's will in the Old Testament and God's will in the New Testament? Do you see the connection between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? For more than 400 years, the Israelites thought God had forgotten them. And yet for close to 2,000 years, God had been preparing the Israelites for the coming of the Christ, the sacrificial lamb, the pure unleavened bread that would be broken so that sin could be replaced with salvation. Then Jesus goes on with the Passover meal. Luke twenty two twenty 20 says, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, in my blood blood which is poured out for you. He said this wine that we drink represents my blood, not the blood of some animal, but my blood which is about to be spilled so that I can establish a new covenant that will once again provide not just forgiveness, 
but ultimately eternal life. Later that night, Jesus was arrested. All of his friends take off and desert him. The next day, he is brutally tortured and beaten. And eventually, he's hung on a cruel Roman cross as a payment for sin. Think about it. The Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice made for you and for me. Wow, that's pretty amazing. It's pretty incredible. The very thing that we could not do for ourselves, God was willing to do for us by allowing his one and only son to die in our place. And that is why we celebrate the Lord's Supper tonight. Now, the Bible says that it is important that before we take Lord's Supper, we stop and we spend some time reflecting on the significance of the sacrifice and the condition of our heart. We want to be as right with God as we can possibly be. I'll remind you that only Christians, those who have placed their faith in Jesus as their Savior, are to take the Lord's Supper. So if you haven't done that, you shouldn't participate in this. However, if that is something that you've been considering, something that you think you're ready to do, let me encourage you that you are just one prayer away from the most important decision you could ever make in your life. And you absolutely would not be the first person to make the decision to become a Christian as a result of the Lord's Supper. So whether you're a Christian who needs to spend some time getting your heart right with God, or whether you're considering a commitment to Christ for the first time in your life, we need to take some time right now. We're going to stop. We're going to seek God. As Christians, use this time to confess sin and ask your Heavenly Father to cleanse your heart. If you're not a Christian right now, this is an opportunity for you to make a life-changing decision. If you're ready, this is a time when you simply say to God, Heavenly Father, I recognize that like everyone in the world, I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus is your Son, and that you sent him to earth to die in my place for my sin. Finally, God, I want to commit the rest of my life and more importantly, my eternity to you. You will be my God and I will be your child forever. Thank you for loving me and thank you for saving me. Amen. If you decide to pray that prayer and to become a Christian, I want to encourage you to contact us through this email address, oakdalebcoffice at gmail.com, so that we can get in touch with you and help you as you begin your new journey of faith. As we bow our heads right now, Jamie is going to play for us, and let's just come humbly before our God. Let me ask you to begin by just asking God to help you open your heart to Him. Ask Him to show you the sin that needs to be dealt with tonight. I feel very confident that if you ask Him this, He will answer you. And as God begins to place that sin on your mind, confess it, admit it, acknowledge it, Once you've confessed that sin, the Bible says the next step is repentance. Repentance means, God, I want to turn completely away from what I've done. I want to go in the opposite direction. I need your help. I can't do that on my own, but I make this promise to you. And then ask for forgiveness. God, will you forgive me of this sin that I have admitted to you, this sin that I have repented of. God, give me forgiveness. And then I would encourage you just to say a, a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for loving me so much. You would save me and not only save me for eternity, but you would forgive me of my sin today. Thank you, God. There is nothing worth more 
that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I have tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long to be
hopefully at this time you have the two elements that you're going to use for the Lord's Supper in front of you, something to eat and something to drink. And I want to ask that in just a moment, the spiritual leader of your home would pass out the bread element to each member of your family. In most cases, the spiritual leader is going to be a husband or a dad, but it may also be a wife or a mom. If you're alone, you're the spiritual leader. Right now, I want the spiritual leader to pick up the bread element. But before you tear pieces off for each member of your family, I want you to pause for just a moment right now and reflect on what that tearing symbolizes. Remember that Jesus was trying to make a, a powerful physical impression on his disciples, and the same impression needs to be made on us. As you tear it, let's pause. And now you can hand the bread element to each member of your family, but don't eat it just yet. Luke 22, verses 23 through 24, says, On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. You may eat the bread. Let's pray together. Father, we give thanks to you for the body of Jesus that was sacrificed for us. God, we understand that you did this because of your love for us. And tonight, we give thanks to you. We celebrate you and we want to glorify you. Thank you, God, that you love us so much. You would allow Jesus to die in this way for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so Shame was a ransom, faithful. 
criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes away going to do the same thing with our cup element, but just before you hand a cup to each family member, I want you to pause and I want you to see it not just as juice or as wine or whatever it may be, but rather as Jesus wanted his disciples to see it as his blood poured out for them. Let's pause for a moment to consider that. Now you can pass out the cup element to each family member, but don't drink it yet. Luke 22, 25 through 26 says, In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the blood of Jesus. We understand the incredible power in that blood, the power to save us, the power to overcome death. God, may we truly understand and appreciate just exactly what that blood represents. God, we love you and we give thanks to you for this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring sons to glory Jesus paid it all all to him my own sin I 
God left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. She I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection, and why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give it. I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Jesus paid it I want to thank you for joining us tonight in this very unique, but hopefully very special celebration of the Lord's Supper. My prayer is that our celebration tonight will help prepare and focus us on the significance of what we'll be celebrating together on Easter morning. We invite you to join us here on Facebook Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for our Easter worship service as we celebrate the single most important event in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for joining us. Good night.